In the last lecture, we saw that markets were extremely dynamic. So the question we want to ask in this lecture is, what corrals that dynamism to the benefit of people confronted with scarcity? Actually, Adam Smith answered that question for us. As we saw earlier, he told us that profit is the motivator, but competition is the regulator. The mechanism that regulates market dynamism is competition. Remember that in debriefing in the chips, we mentioned the unfortunate tendency to talk about competition between buyers and sellers, as if consumers enter the market ready to do battle with the sellers. Thinking about our experiences in the activity and in life, we realize that markets force buyers and sellers to cooperate because they only gain if the transaction takes place. So review with the students, where is the competition in markets? Who do buyers and sellers compete with? Your students should know, but first remind them of their experience within the chips. Who did the buyers compete with? Ah, other buyers who might be willing to pay a higher price. And who did the sellers compete with? Right, other sellers willing to offer lower prices. And why did they compete? Well, the buyers competed because they wanted the limited goods and services, and the sellers competed for profit. Competition for profit. That's the invisible hand that Adam Smith identified as the impersonal regulator of markets. And students experienced how quickly it worked to bring a very disorganized market to equilibrium in which both buyers and sellers gained. So that's the model. But considering it in light of our everyday experience tells us that the amount and type of competition in markets varies. And we know that there are times when we feel as buyers that we are fighting the sellers. So let's dissect our market model a little bit with an eye to the role of competition. First, let's articulate what we learned about what markets are supposed to do from developing our models of supply and demand. Effective markets do three things. They make the least opportunity cost use of resources. Now, why? Well, because suppliers are motivated by profit to reduce production cost, and they want to provide products that consumers actually value. Next, markets get goods, services, and resources to those who value them most. And the way they do this is through the information carried through that mechanism of dynamic pricing. And finally, by doing the first two, they reduce the impact of scarcity, which was our goal all along. So it behooves us to ask, what are the conditions that make markets effective? And really, that's another way to ask, how can we ensure that markets remain competitive? Effective markets need to have lots of buyers and sellers. You can illustrate this point by having your students play another round of In the Chips, but this time, have only two sellers and let them sit next to each other. What do you think will happen to the price, the number of transactions, and the level of general surliness among the buyers? You're right, I mean, that whole wealth generating process definitely slows down when there are fewer sellers. But there's an important caveat to add here, and that's that the potential for lots of buyers and sellers may be as significant as the actual number. Suppose, for example, that there are only a few big sellers of a product. If it's easy for other sellers to enter that market, then the existence of those potential competitors may still be a very effective constraint. Next, effective markets are those for which there are many substitutes. And in the chips, all the chips were the same, and there were lots of sellers, so there were lots of perfect substitutes. But note that products don't have to be exactly the same to substitute well. We often get confused about this if we think about the specific product rather than the want it satisfies. So remember when we talked about substitutes when we were looking at demand? The number of substitutes increases if we go from thinking about, say, specifically Nike running shoes to a broader category of athletic shoes. And then it gets even bigger if we broaden the category to just plain old shoes, okay? Similarly, the number of substitutes increases if we go from gasoline to transportation. 
the gasoline example is a good one for reinforcing that importance of entry and exit into a market. Just counting the number of firms selling a specific product may not give us all the information we need to correctly gauge the level of competition. Soft drinks are a good example. There are really only two big soft drink companies, but would anyone seriously argue that they aren't competitive? I mean, think about all the potential substitutes. And if you're not sure, just go to the drink aisle in your grocery store. And by the way, don't forget to notice the Starbucks you walked by on the, on the way in. Or as you get your 10th free refill of Pepsi or Coke at a restaurant or fast food place, think about why these two behemoth companies price their products so low that restaurants practically give it away. Pepsi and Coke compete because even the smallest fraction of a percent increase or decrease in sales in this market is big money. Another condition for effective markets is access to information. The more knowledge people have about products and prices, the more competitive the market. You're probably not going to like to hear this, but advertising performs an essential role in making markets effective. I know, I know, I know they're often misleading and sometimes downright deceptive, and sometimes people feel tricked or manipulated. But think about how dynamic the advertising game is and how quickly the really egregious practices get exposed. And would you really like having to drive around from store to store to find the sale when you want to buy tires? Or did the radio ad tell you where and when to check? And of course, advertising isn't the only source of market information. Think of businesses like Consumer Reports or the blogs and the ratings that show up on the internet. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, effective markets have clear rules of the game that are consistently enforced. Does this mean that there's never fraud or that a seller or buyer never gets away with cheating someone? Well, obviously not. But it does mean that those instances are notable because they're rare. That we expect to enter markets without being cheated and we expect that contracts will be upheld. So the bottom line is that in competitive markets, that is, markets that effectively perform the task of reducing the impact of scarcity, neither buyers nor sellers can exert control over the price of a product. As students experienced in In the Chips, sellers don't set prices, markets do. But by watching prices, we can tell how competitive a market is. So here's how it works. What happens to prices in a competitive market. They tend to go down, don't they? And how far can they go down? Think about it this way. The seller's out to make a profit, which is the difference between the price the market sets and his production cost. And competition is pushing down the market price. What's happening to the profit? It keeps getting squeezed out in that vice, doesn't it? So what's a good profit motivated seller to do? Finds a way to reduce the production cost. As the price pushes down toward the level of production cost, the sellers work to reduce that level. That's a good deal for us buyers, huh? If we continually see falling prices or improvements in products, we know that the relentless process of competition is at work. But what if prices are staying well above cost so that the producers continue to make big profits? Then we should be asking ourselves, where's the competition? Because it must be the case that something is preventing or reducing competition in that market. When producers are able to escape or reduce the grip of competition, we say they have market power. And it turns out that the way to get market power is to have control over the quantity of the product offered for sale. When suppliers can restrict the total amount offered for sale, they end up selling to those demanders who are willing to pay higher prices. Remember, buyers are competing with each other by being willing to pay more. When we see prices staying well above the level of production cost, we know that for some reason, competition is being stifled in that market. And so our next question is to investigate how they can do that. Here's a picture of this situation on a graph. If the producer offers 100 for sale, he'll only be able to sell all 100 at a price of $3. But 
if he only offers 45, he'll be able to sell them for $10 each to people who value them at $10 a piece. So revenue, $450 versus $300. Hmm, what producer wouldn't want to be able to do that? Now in a competitive market, if one producer tries to produce less, other sellers would jump in and produce more and the price would stay low. The only way for a producer to get that market price to stay high is to be able to control the quantity. As you saw in the video and as students discovered in the cartels and competition simulation, controlling the quantity supplied in a competitive market is hard to do. But we do know from experience that there are conditions in which firms are able to exert some measure of market power. Here's a list of products. So on a scrap of paper, jot down whether you think each of these producers has market power. And if they do, whether they have a little or a great deal. And how did they get it? One key to determining whether there is market power is to ask yourself about substitutes. Yes, I did say earlier that there are substitutes for everything, and that's true. But some of them are more acceptable to us than others. We would call those near substitutes as opposed to, say, far substitutes. And we know that there are products for which the substitutes are so costly as to seem non-existent. For example, your work only offers one medical insurance option, or your city has licensed only one cable company, or you have to buy your electricity from the regional public service. There are substitutes. I mean, I suppose you could buy a bunch of big flashlights or burn candles, but really? Really? I don't think so. It's not practical. So in other situations, though, the existence and acceptability of the substitutes is not the result of some outside forces, but it's the result of your preferences. If you never learned to ride a bike and the bus doesn't run close to your work, you may feel that the gasoline companies have market power over you. But that's not really different than thinking that Pepsi is not an acceptable substitute for Coke. The alternatives exist, you just don't like them and you consider switching to have very high opportunity cost. So that isn't really the kind of power we'd regard as threatening to productive endeavors or to the rules of the game. We may not like it, but we wouldn't call it market power. Which is not to say that companies don't like to have market power. They do, and they work hard to get it. We see efforts to gain market power going on all around us, as through the advertising. And it probably should be reassuring to us that those efforts are continuous because it suggests that if they work at all, it's only for a short time and then the competition increases again. One key in trying to acquire market power is to find ways to limit the available substitutes. If a producer can do that, then he's on the road to acquiring serious market power. Mergers and buyouts of competitors that might work for a while, but we've seen throughout history that big doesn't necessarily insulate you from competition, especially if that competition is the development of new products that substitute for the one that the big fish is producing. The computer technology industry gives us plenty of examples of, of that kind of thing happening. Advertising, that's another way to try to increase market power. Essentially, the advertising trying to get you to eliminate the acceptable substitutes yourself by saying you wouldn't buy anything else. If you will only buy Nikes, then they've done a pretty good job. High entry costs, that can reduce competition and confer some market power. It ain't cheap to build electric generating plants, for example. So there aren't as many potential competitors as there would be for a less expensive product. A unique geographic location might confer an advantage. Being the only gas station in a 400 mile expanse of desert highway is a pretty good way to reduce the number of substitutes. Notice, however, that none of these efforts to reduce the availability of substitutes completely eliminates the potential for competitors to enter. And also remember that profit acts like magnets. If gas in the desert or generating electricity becomes highly profitable, the competitors are going to show up. So the real danger to competitive markets, the only sure way to gain the power to limit quantity supplied, 
comes when producers acquire market power by getting the rules of the game changed, and that's done through government. Now, sometimes we believe we have very good reasons for changing the rules, and we may, but we still need to be aware that by doing so, we've restricted competition, and we've granted market power that will keep quantity lower and prices higher than they would be if that power hadn't been granted. Licensing requirements for barbers, hairdressers, realtors, doctors, nurses, even teachers. They're usually justified as being in the public interest, and they may be, but they also serve to reduce the number of people who can supply specific goods and services, haircuts, rides to the airport, flu shots, or social studies homework. Patents and copyrights do the same thing by granting exclusive property rights to the inventor or the author. Uh, although patents expire, so the market power is only conferred for the life of the patent. Regulations on health, safety, fuel economy, the environment, even if we believe they are valuable and necessary, they raise the entry cost to suppliers wanting to enter an industry thus keeping the quantity supplied lower and the price higher than it would be without those regulations. Your textbooks probably have a chapter on market structures, including those things listed on the slide. In general, the extent of market power increases as we go up the list, but let me suggest that discussing these variations in terms of market power and how it's acquired may be more enlightening to students than having them memorize this list of names of market structures to try to fit the pegs into the holes. The real world is a little messier than the neat categories suggest, and having to ferret out whether and how a firm exercises market power is a useful exercise. You might also find useful the, the labels price taker and price searcher to help students identify and understand the process of market power. Price takers have no market power. In other words, they take the price the market offers. So they exist in very competitive markets like agriculture, where their product is so homogeneous that it's hard to differentiate one producer from another. Consumers can substitute one producer's goods for the other without even thinking about it. So the producer has no choice but to take the market price and produce as much as he can in order to make more profit. Firms with market power, on the other hand, are price searchers. They're searching for the pricing that gives them the greatest profit within the structure of their market. Now generally, as you might expect, these markets have features that make them less competitive. Here's how it might work for a, a luxury yacht company or an airplane manufacturer. Like all producers, they face the reality of the law of demand. They know that as the price increases, the quantity sold is going to decrease. And in fact, because there aren't a huge number of buyers out there, the company might have a pretty good idea of what their market looks like. So if you only produce one airplane, um, you could sell it for $400 million. Not bad. So let's try producing two. But if you produce two, turns out you can only sell both if you drop the price to $350 million. $50 million drop seems like a lot, but if you get stubborn and don't drop the price, you've got a plane sitting on your hands, and the cost to produce it wasn't peanuts. Oh yeah, there is that cost thing. The cost to produce one more plane? $250 million. Your first reaction is, wow, at that cost, you better sell as many as you can. But the producer does the math. And it turns out that because of that downward sloping demand curve, his profit is greatest if he makes and sells only two airplanes or yachts or whatever it is we're talking about. If the market were more competitive, more would be produced and the price would fall, but it's not. And having searched for and found the price that will make him the most profit, the producer limits production to two and keeps the price right there at a cool $350 million, thank you very much. Okay, here's another example of how price searchers can maximize profit. Suppose that Blue Sky Airlines has collected the following information through analysis of their ticket sales. 
If they charge $250 for a seat on a plane from here to there, they can sell 75 tickets. If they lower the price to $150, then they can sell 175 tickets. That's good. But notice that that 175 number includes the 75 people who would have been willing to pay $250. Those are happy people, but not happy at the airline. Okay, so let's go on. If they lower the price to $50, they could get 375 buyers, 200 more than at the higher prices. Is that a good deal or a bad deal? The question for the airline is, what price should they charge in order to make the most profit? Now, we need a little bit more information in order to solve this problem. First, the plane has 200 seats, period. Quantity supplied is fixed for this flight. And second, the marginal cost to fly the plane from here to there is $13,000. Okay, let's do the math. Check out the chart. And you notice that the airline maximizes profit by charging $150 and filling the plane. Okay, so the profit they end up with is $13,250. But they aren't happy knowing that there are 75 people in those seats who would have paid $100 more for their tickets. $100 times 75 people is $7,500 for goodness sakes. But then somebody at the airline says, what if we could sell the tickets for different prices? The answer to that question is that then profits would double. Not bad. Okay, but so now the problem is, how do you find out who the people are who would pay $250? After all, you can't just ask them, how much would you be willing to pay for your ticket? But Maybe you can get hints by noticing things about them, like how far ahead did they purchase their tickets? Or are they willing to stay there over Saturday night? Now, if you've booked plane tickets, you're familiar with this practice. And it's the result of the airlines figuring out things like that business travelers often make last minute purchases and are willing to pay higher prices. Or that business travelers want to get home from their trips before the weekend. And don't want to stay over Saturday night. This process is called price discrimination. Okay, now stop for a minute here because it's worth taking a minute to remind your students that the word discriminate only means the ability to differentiate or to separate into groups. Yeah, I know, we use the term in everyday converse, conversation to mean treating one group unfairly, but in this instance, we're talking about people being willing buyers of a product. So when we talk about price discrimination, what we mean is that if a producer can easily discriminate, that is easily identify the characteristics of different groups of consumers who are willing to pay different amounts, then he might be able to figure out a way to charge those groups different prices, prices they are willing to pay for the same thing. Besides the airlines, can you think of other businesses that do that? Successful discriminators that we're familiar with include movie theaters. Look around at the audience at different times of the day or different days of the week. Or good old universities. And actually, they do ask you how much you can pay. And most of us willingly tell them by filling out the financial aid application. But in any case, what we're saying here is that demanders have different margins. And price discrimination is possible when the producer can identify those margins easily. Okay, to sum up then, what have we discovered about competition and market power? First and foremost, we can't ever forget this, that as long as a good is sold in the market, the market determines the price. Even the most powerful firms cannot set prices. So, firms that have market power have the ability to exert some control over the quantity of their product that they offer for sale. Okay, remember firms don't set price, they set quantity. Before we end this lecture, let's bring our discussion back to our economic reasoning propositions and the context of world poverty. 
Beginning with our understanding of the power of price as an incentive, we've looked at how prices emerge from the interactions of buyers and sellers, how they provide information, and how they adjust to the changing circumstances of those buyers and sellers. In this lecture, we suggested that two, the importance of two other institutions, property rights and the rule of law, for maintaining well-functioning competitive markets. Economic reasoning proposition number four asserts the importance of institutions. And in an earlier lesson, we identified markets as one of the institutions associated with the economic growth that's necessary to combat world poverty. So as you work through the assignment problems and the remaining lessons, I want you to think about the doors that market institutions open for the poor and how they do it by making more goods and services available at lower prices, by encouraging competition that in turn encourages innovation, by creating jobs for workers, and even by providing opportunities for the poor to be entrepreneurs. Last slide then. What are the big ideas from the two lectures in lesson four? Open markets benefit both buyers and sellers by allowing them to trade at low cost. Open entry and exit and competition are necessary for markets to function effectively. Other institutions, including defined property rights and the rule of law, enhance the functioning of markets. And finally, open markets encourage the economic growth that's the key to reducing poverty.